One thing can be said with certainty. Gone to Redeem is practically the same age as this world. Flipping through the works that describe the pivotal events of the continent's history, one can find his name in the margins of the pages. However, not everyone dares to declare that his actions are evil. Gaunter carefully chooses which secret to reveal and which to save, and he never lies. He might give a child a toy that would give rise to certain dreams, or help a lost man find his way home. Afterward, all he had to do was watch from the shadows and chuckle quietly. So why do people blame him for all their troubles? It is simply amazing, the confidence with which we are willing to claim that gods and other higher beings are responsible for our lives. Gaunter Redim, Master Mirror, the Man of Glass, the Merchant of Mirrors, a fine character we could talk about forever. Smart, cunning, powerful, devoid of human weaknesses but not devoid of human vices. Vain and self-righteous, demon from some other world who came to Neverland just for the fun of it, to play with human destinies. He exposes the vices of man, he offers to ask for anything, and in return he demands the most precious thing of all, a soul. And here it seems is a man that Gaunter helps. It is in his power to solve some really important problems of this world in exchange for just one soul. But this man's request is always selfish, petty, and in its essence, disgusting. Money, fame, power. Gaunter Redim's character is fascinating. He brings out all the evil in man. He exposes a soul stained with vices. It's been seven years since Gaunter appeared on our screens and people are still speculating about who he is, why he exists, what his motivations are, and his role in the world. Fortunately, CD Projekt Red, the developer who created such an amazing character, even in the absence of major projects, throws up a lot of new information, sometimes hinting and sometimes outright pointing at the role of Gaunter Redim in the destiny of Neverland. And today, we'll talk about the Man of Glass based on this new information, right here on our GameWiz channel. To begin with, let us return to the past, when Nilfgaard was but a distant southern country that in no way threatened the confident powers of the north. It was under the rule of Fergus Var Emrys. It must be said that Fergus was not the worst emperor in history. He was successful in domestic and foreign politics and strengthened the army. He made a treaty of cooperation with Kavar, equalized the rights of women and men in the army. He won several wars, but he was also unwilling to share power which made the elite of the empire angry with him. The noble houses of Nilfgaard conspired to throw off the inconvenient ruler, but they needed someone to take his place. At first, there was none. But then suddenly one of the successful warlords appeared on the horizon. He is now called only the Usurper, for his real name has been erased from history. And he was prompted to overthrow the government by a familiar soldier. The Usurper did not know who it really was. He didn't know it was the great demon gone to redeem. The usurper began as an ordinary man who rose from the lowest levels. He was a commoner, but then he joined the army. By his bravery and ruthlessness to his enemies, he, who in the future would be called the usurper, won himself the first rank of lieutenant. And then on his way he met another soldier, who called himself gone to redeem, and not named for a southerner. They became friends and a new lieutenant did not even notice how Gaunter began to casually put terrible ideas in his head. Ideas that Fergus was a fool, that his orders were insane and will only lead to more deaths, that he needed a decisive man to change everything, his arguments were ironclad and everything he said came true. And then he suddenly disappeared from the lieutenant's life. Maybe he died on the field of one of the battles, who knows, but the ideas of overthrowing the government and the current emperor could no longer be uprooted from his head. Nevertheless, at that time the young soldier had no opportunity for a coup. That is why he continued to vent all his anger on the battlefields. This allowed him to assert himself really quickly. He was promoted to the rank of general and his hopes of a coup d'etat grew stronger. He believed that only his genius could achieve everything. He believed that he was very successful in turning even the most insane orders of the emperor into magnificent maneuvers. In his mind, he had two choices, washing the blood of men who had died for Fergus's foolish orders or washing the blood of the fool who had given them. If he thought about it long enough, it was not such a difficult choice. So the usurper began to look for options to carry out his plans and at one point he contacted the nobles who were looking for a replacement for Fergus and then there was a coup. 
The emperor was killed and the new ruler was a recent commoner. Particularly cruel was the usurper's treatment of the son and heir of Fergus, a boy named Emhir. The wizard allied to the usurper, Bratens, turned him here into a humanoid urchin, drove him into the woods and set the dogs on him. He thought the boy would not survive, but he not only overcame all difficulties. In the future, Emhir returned to Nilfgaard and ended the usurper's careless life by brutally killing him and his minions. In parallel, Emhir married Pavetta, princess of Sintra, and became the father of a girl named Ciri. The usurper did not know all this, nor he did even think of a soldier named Gontor Adin, who had once planted the idea of a coup in the young lieutenant's mind. And of course, he could not have suspected that this same Gontor was a powerful entity, that Gontor Adin nudges events in the direction he wants and then watches what happens to human destinies. So we find that Master Mira pushed the usurper to overthrow the Ivar Emre's family and in fact started the process of reuniting the urchin of Erlenwald and Princess Pavetta. Started the process by which the child of destiny named Ciri was born, which made Emhir of our Emre angry and compromising an ambitious emperor that turned into the white flame dancing on the barrows of his enemies and went on a great war in the north. Human elves, arrogant predictions and other nonsense related to fate and destiny, Gontor Adim finds them striking and amusing. The law of surprise alone is worth it. Give back what you already have but don't know about. And these people honestly think that Gontor is a fraud and his terms are ambiguous? Unbelievable. After all, all he does is open the eyes of those who wanted to find themselves a place in this world. He merely demonstrates the madness of the world and the possibilities it offers. He points the way to various endings. The individual is left to choose. Will the majestic woman break or keep her spouse's word? Would Queen Calante break her husband's word? Gaunt Redim could not know this, but he kept pushing events in the direction he was interested in. And he continued to observe human destinies with a passion, observing human vices. But things could have turned out very differently. Let's move on to Skellige. These islands have always been home to a fierce and warlike people. Gaunter knew this and watched the clan rivalries in this land with no less interest than the rest of Neverland. For example, he was glad to push the events that led to the Ancraid clan ruling the islands. He needed that too. In the palace of Queen Calante, on the very night of the reunion of Pavetta and the Urchin, it was the Ancraids who were to be present. It so happened that a long time ago, two of the strongest clans, the Drummonds and the Ancrates, came together in a battle for power on Skelligate. The Drummonds were originally outnumbering the others, and they were ruled by the wise and kind king Skjordal, who was more concerned with the well-being of the country than with raids. For example, it was on his orders that the lighthouse Elberg was built to light the sea route to the village of Arnbjorn, so that Skelligian ships would not perish at sea and the Ancrates were ruled by Harold the Cripple, a pirate, a hero of many battles and a fearless warrior, but a very cruel man. Harold was a mediocre warrior, until one day a beer mangled his leg. The bone healed crooked and the pain haunted him for the rest of his days, but Harold became a better fighter than before. Just because Harold felt pain all the time, day and night, he was as familiar with it as anyone, and that meant he knew how to inflict it too. He knew what a hit, to take away strength and cause the biggest suffering. Harold was notorious, not because he robbed and killed, every self-respecting islander did that. Harold did not leave his enemies the right to an honorable death. He would not let his enemies go until they were twitching at his feet, begging for mercy. And Harold was to lose the war, and the Drummonds were to reign on Skellige. But at one point, the leader of the great clan Tirshak, named Tirgvi, whose family had supported the Drummonds since time immemorial, suddenly betrayed the oaths of his ancestors and defected with his men to the side of the Ancrates. Why did this happen? Who prompted him to take such a step? No one will ever know. It is known only that a certain man of glass was watching the political situation in the islands with great interest. With the support of the Tirshaks, the Ancrates gained a decisive advantage over the Drummonds and they were able to win the war, putting their leader Harold the Cripple on the throne. Centuries later, Harold and Crate's heir named Crack, who ties fate to the royal family of Sintra, arrived in the capital of that kingdom and witnessed the amazing incident with the witcher Geralt, the monster Urchan and Princess Pavetta, but everything could have turned out absolutely differently. Only one small detail changed everything. 
one inexplicable decision of the Tirshak clan leader who betrayed the centuries-old vows of his ancestors and chose the deception and murder of his fellows. Gontar Dim has always had his eye on amazing people, the Witcher hero who is willing to sacrifice the lives of thousands for the sake of a single destiny, or the amazing child whose power could become his doom. Elvin is a young child destined to go mad to become the Grandmaster of the Order of the Flaming Rose named Jacques de Oldersburg and to end the lives of many in the vain hope of saving the world. Already since childhood, he had attracted attention as an exceptional child with incredible abilities. And though Elvin's magical gift was obvious, he was still primarily a child. He loved to play with toy soldiers. These toy soldiers were given to Elvin by a strange man who called himself a Merchant of Mirrors. The soldiers had a flaming rose on their armor, and they were opposed by evil elves. This is how Alvin learned to play the Elf Killer, when valiant soldiers with a flaming rose on their chests had to destroy all the pointy-eared villains. The idea. Once again, the idea planted in the head determined the man's fate. When Alvin grew up, he began to play Elf Killer in real life, and the living soldiers with the red rose on their armor always surrounded him because the boy became Jacques de Oldsburg, Grand Master of the Order of the Flaming Rose. In Jacques's mind, visions of the world's doom appeared. They both frightened him and made him stronger. As a result of that, the Grand Master hardened and was ready for any measures for the sake of the common good, even to cut short the lives of an incredible multitude of living beings simply because the thought of saving Neverland burned in his mind. It all began with the toys a strange merchant of mirrors had given him, an innocent child's game. Gonta Redim follows some plan that he understands alone. He plays with people's fates on any, both large and small scale. For example, Gonter finds human traditions almost as entertaining as playing with fate. Sometimes he even personally checks to see if the old customs are still being followed. As he wanders around the world, he observes peasants burning fires to appease the dead and tying red ribbons around cradles, supposedly to ward off ghosts. Pretending to be a beggar, he asks homes for food, and when the night of Seovina arrives, he waits for people to hide from the hapless spirits in their homes. Those who have not had time to hide, or have drunk themselves senseless, sometimes meet Gonter himself instead of the dead, and those who refuse to respect the customs and comply with his humble request risk seeing his true appearance. He can turn a beautiful noble woman into a monster. Merlin de Trastamara became his victim because she did not respect the customs and rudely chased the beggar away when he asked her for some food on the night of the Selvina. The stranger broke his spoon and cursed Merlin. You, beautiful woman, will never want to look at yourself in the mirror again, for on the night of Selvina, one cannot refuse a man a piece of bread. So say the legends of men, and Gontor Dim not only follows them, but embodies them. Merlin de Trastamara was transformed into a terrible beast, a white, and she paid dearly for not following her ancestors' traditions. At least something is known about Gontor's influence on human history. There are some hints in historical chronicles from which you can draw conclusions, but the non-humans somehow do not actively remember someone similar to Master Mirror, and he is interested in their fates. It seems that Master Mirror has no effect on monsters and non-humans, at least they fall prey to him far less frequently than humans. It's hard to say what causes that, for they, like all humans, are not strangers to greed, envy and stupidity. Are they really beyond Odim's control? Perhaps so, but I doubt it's the whole truth. After a closer look, one can understand that Gaunter doesn't interfere in the fate of monsters and non-humans, just not directly. After all, all it takes is helping a cruel prince ascend to the throne for thousands of dryads to meet their doom. Isn't that so? The kingdom of Kerak is small, bordering the kingdom of Rokilon, which belongs to the dryads. King Belahan ruled there, a cunning old lord who would do anything for power. It would not be difficult for him to quarrel with his sons and exile them just to keep them from claiming his throne. Belahan was also very fond of young girls. He had married many times before, but always at some point his wives bored him. Nevertheless, Belahan was rather neutral towards the Drides of Brokilon, which was a strange position in these parts. The king's eldest son and rightful heir was his son Veraxis, and from his childhood Belahan showed no love for the offspring. He teased him, proving his superiority. 
Fathers are often jealous of their children's strength and talent, and children do not always notice. And so it was here. Varaxis was healthy, handsome, strong and clever, while Belahan was becoming a decrepit old man with each passing year. And no matter how much he shouted about his power, every night he still saw the truth in the mirror. He felt it in the pain of his joints and in the looks of those around him. And most frequently, the king felt his old age when he looked at his son, young and full of strength. One day, Belahan's bitterness was met with rejection of this attitude from Viraxis. A quarrel took place, a long and loud one, and after only a few hours, the prince was banished from Kerak, even without the necessary judgment in such cases. The king was so angry at his son that he forbade his name to be uttered or even mentioned at court. Belahan would never admit this, but the main reason for his banishment was not his disagreement with Viraxis. The prince was banished only because he was young, strong and healthy. In a word, the opposite of Belahan. But the king did not know that in time the prince would return to take his own. After all, someone had instilled in Varaxis the idea that he must take revenge. Someone had even given him the idea of how the prince could take his crown. I wonder who it was. Varaxis sent his mistress, an undertrained sorceress named Ildiko, to Belahan. The beautiful girl quickly became a favorite of the ruler, and he eventually chose her to be his next wife. The king set a date for the wedding. But Ildiko was faithful to Varaxis, and he arrived in the port of Kerak right at the time of the feast. The girl gave the old man a gift, the medallion, as a sign of love and fidelity, a sign that a decrepit old ruler could still be loved. It was for all to see. While the king was trying on his clothes before the wedding ceremony, he hung the medallion around his neck, and it magically tightened, killing the ruler on the spot. At the same moment, the throne room of Kerak was occupied by Viraxis, who had secretly arrived in the city, and the mercenaries the prince had earlier recruited quickly seized all the nobles in the festive wedding hall and escorted them to the new ruler, and it was right hand said Ildiko. No one had any choice but to recognize the banished prince as the new king. Power got passed on to Viraxis and Ildiko, and they turned out to be ardent pursuers of non-humans. More than a hundred of Brokelon's dryads were slaughtered on their orders. But who was it that drove the story in this direction? Well, you know his name, and his actions are a red thread running through this narrative. The Man of Glass. But why would he do all this? He didn't make contracts with any of the above-mentioned individuals. For some reason, he just played with destinies and pushed people to illogical actions at different time intervals. He did it with neat surgical movements. Why? Maybe he had some grand plan. Or was he just acting again in order to simply fulfill some contract? Well, Gaunter Redem is enigmatic, but after all he has done, he appears in the pages of the notes of a certain Rivian magician, Amadeus Ritterhoff. This sorcerer was mediocre in ancient times and therefore wanted to become powerful. He found ancient papers about a being of incredible power who could grant any wish and in the course of numerous unsuccessful attempts, he succeeded in summoning this being. Amadeus Ritterhoff wanted only one thing, power. He wished to excel in magical pursuits. Therefore, he was willing to meet any condition of the summoned creature, even when he asked for the wizard's soul in return. They made a pact. I, Amadeus Ritterhoff, in exchange for a thorough knowledge of the arcane magical arts, hereby pledge my soul. I shall repay my debt only at such a time when the sun rises over Rivia in the dark of night. I sign this contract with my blood in full understanding that it cannot under any circumstances be breached. The sorcerer thought he had deceived the summoned creature. After all, that's impossible. Under no circumstances would the sun rise over Rivia at night, not unless it was the end of the world. But what difference would that make? But the demon only smiled and disappeared with the pact. Where had he gone? For how long? It didn't matter. The main thing is that years later, the Second Northern War began. Nilfgar troops entered the kingdom of Lyria and Rivia, and at night, the golden sun on black flags rose over Rivia. The condition was fulfilled. Amadeus Ritterhoff was obliged to give his soul, and the summoned demon came for it. And no one will ever know why the flags with the golden sun flew over Lyria and Rivia. Could it be the fate of this world, or maybe a man named Gaunter Redim pushed history in the direction he wanted? Everyone draws their own conclusions. Well, that's all for today. Like this video and subscribe to our channel if you like our work. Click on the damn bell so you don't miss any of our videos on the Witcher universe on the channel. 
If you have questions about the story, you can find the answers in other videos in the Witches Universe Stories series. Anyway, thank you all for watching and see you soon.